Welcome back to the Midday Show. My guest today is a very talented comedian and writer who is the host of the very popular podcast, Comedy Bang Bang, whose TV iteration, also titled Comedy Bang Bang, airs on IFC Thursday nights at 10 p.m. Central. It's an honor to have him here on the program. Please welcome Scott Ackerman. Hello. Very good. And as I should probably say, as always on the TV show, you have a subtitle with a mispronounced name. And this, today it is Clock Stopperman. Yes. Clock Stopper. Is that today's? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a reference to a very old Nickelodeon sci fi movie. Oh, oh, the Clock Stoppers? Exactly. Oh, okay. I didn't know that was a Nickelodeon movie. All it, right. it was. Great. Produced by Nickelodeon Pictures. So we are broadcasting from beautiful Overland Park, Kansas, and this is not your first brush with Can- with Overland Park, Kansas this year. That's right. I was in Kansas, wasn't I? Yeah. Earlier? Yeah. Year? You were actually down the street from where we're recording. Where? At the, uh, at the bowling alley? At the bowling alley. Yeah, we're on 100. 100- wow. We are at 123rd Street, and you are on 135th Street. Away. Yeah, it's amazing. And you were on the red carpet beforehand, and there was a guy yelling at you, what's up, hot dog? Okay, I remember this. Yes, I was very, very annoyed at this man. Go on. That was me. Oh, no. I mean, he was great. Yeah. <laughs> It, well, and I, at that point, I, I knew I was coming back to do the show this year. Um and I really wanted to have you on, but I also just wanted to get a picture because I was such a big fan, and I thought, how would I do it? I'll yell, what's up, hot dog, at him. That won't annoy him at all. Well, you know, a lot of people are yelling, hey, dog, mad now as well, which is another one of the wonderful catchphrases from Comedy Bang Bang. So uh, yell either of those at me, and I'll know that you're a fan, and I'll usually come over. Awesome. And how did you enjoy um, the Big Slick fundraiser? Uh, it was great. It was my first time doing it, and, um, you know, it was a lot of stuff. Um, they really pack uh, a lot of activities in um, in that two-day period, but it was it was really cool, and um, it was great that we raised all that money for the, uh, the children's hospital. It was really awesome. Definitely. And you coming right hot off the presses of writing for Andy Samberg for the 2015 Pride and Time Emmy Awards. That's right. Yeah, we just finished on Sunday. Were they Sunday or no? No, it was a week ago. Yeah, <laughs> I don't it, know what day it is. Yeah, and so you also won an Emmy for Between Two Ferns. I did. Jeez, it's been a weird Emmy full year. Definitely. Um, I, I did more than that. I hosted the LA Regional Emmys. I presented at the Creative Arts Emmys, and I worked with the Emmy Board to change the the category and uh into sketch and talk show so a you any year better just call your middle name emmy oh i also presented at the college emmys oh my god too much too I much out. i'm part of the system yes um you can't trust the system as andy says yep, that's true so one of the big things in that emmy that i really wanted to ask you about since you of course were one of the writers was the hbo now login what was the genesis for that idea? Of course, Andy gave a little backstory about how the a- HBO um, CEO said that he's not worried about password sharing. But how did that idea of actually giving out a real working login, and I tried it at home, and it worked. But the great idea problem was that everybody logged into it and it worked, that nobody could watch anything. Right, yeah. It was, um, you know, we talked to the process for doing the whole show is, you know, we talked a lot about just kind of what was going on with TV at the time. Um, you know, our opening video was about sort of peak TV um, and how, you know, there's almost too much TV for people to watch. People feel behind when they're at dinner parties. So we talked a lot about that and we just, you know, I mean, we talked about a lot of things and a couple of weeks before the show we were talking about streaming services and we were talking about HBO and HBO Go and now and, and someone brought up that the, that the CEO said he didn't think password sharing was a problem and I, I don't really know how we thought of it but we just suddenly said 
did find out that, you, that only three people could stream at the same time, which was the one sort of bummer. Only three devices could stream at the same time. But um, we, we actually were set up for if um, it got shut down, immediately we had another account that we were going to give out <laughs> and say, well, HBO shut that one down, but here's another one, and give out the other account. But HBO didn't shut it down and actually let people watch stuff on it for a while. So I think it's shut down now, but I'm not really sure. But at a certain point, they shut it down or it doesn't work anymore or something. But, but at the time, they even promoted it on their Twitter feed and they even gave out the password. Yeah, and that was just a way to really kind of involve the audience, but still having them be part of the joke. Yeah, I thought it was cool. I mean, we we definitely talked about it a lot and thought it would get a lot of attention, which I was happy that it did. That was one of the most kind of blogged about parts of the show. Um but we also wanted to make sure that Andy was funny while he was talking about it. So the language of what he was saying, we, we worked on a lot and tried to punch up a lot and gave him more jokes during it because he didn't want to just like dryly give out the number, you know. But, but once we really settled on the attitude of like, you know, a guy who's letting millions and tens of millions of people watch Game of Thrones for free, you know, and yeah. like that's a fun attitude to me and it's a fun image to put in people's minds of, you know, uh, hey, you know, we're le letting tens of millions of people get away with something, you know, I, I think that's really fun. Definitely. And Andy has such a distinct style of voice when it comes to like a presenting mode because we saw him at the Comedy Central roast of James Rango and that was very very distinctive in the way he presented um, his material and that definitely showed on the Emmys as well how was creating that model creating those um, interstitials with um, with Andy how, how was that being able to c cater it to his language it's interesting because he's not really a mean performer you mentioned the um the roast and you know a lot of that roast was him complimenting james franco um exactly it, that's something we, it was something we talked about a lot um you know there there are hosts out there that kind of do slams and you know when we do the between two ferns that's like something that we write a lot of is just slams you know and like interestingly worded slams are always fun to write. It's, it's something that I'm actually relatively good at. Um, and so I was kind of wondering about the monologue, you know, what was the tone we were going to take? And um, we, we really wanted to make sure that the tone of the entire show be not a mean show and be one that was fun and goofy and... You know, Andy likes slams too, but we, we want to make sure that the preponderance of the jokes wasn't just slams. So, you know, there was one joke that I wrote about this year we said goodbye to Parks and Recreation and The Daily Show, and we also said goodbye to True Detective, even though that's still on the air. <laughs> we went back and forth on that one about, like, you know, is it too mean? Is it is it out of character for Andy? We knew it would kill. And it, it turned out it was one of the most talked about jokes on the show. But, you know, it becomes a real conversation about, like, is it something we want to include? Because technically it's a slam on something. But, you know, we, we allowed for a few of those in there. But if you look at the actual jokes that he does in the monologue, um, you know, I would say 80% of them are, are kind of fun and, and not mean spirited jokes. I mean, the whole... Uzo Aduba is the new Ed Asner. That was brilliant. Fun. Yeah, that's that's just fun, you know, and it's yeah. just like celebrating people. And I think that's what Andy really wanted to do. So if if you look at the if you look at just the whole of his hosting tenure, you know, he's doing stuff like showing George R. R. Martin as a baby at the very first Emmys, and he's doing stuff like having Tatiana Maslany fighting over a can of beans with Tony Hale, and, and that's all just like fun, goofy stuff that's really just makes you feel good about watching, and I think that's something he wanted to achieve, and I think that's why he's getting such great notices after the fact. And I cannot agree with you more. We are going to be back with more of Scott Ackman 
right after the break. But first, Scott, Twitter handle, where can people find you? Uh, Scott Ackerman, which is my last name spelled A-U-K-E-R-M-A-N. Okay, and we are going to kill time by asking a very simple question. Um, how do you balance work and family? It's very difficult for me. I mean, that's why I'm so interested in it. Um, you know, I mean, uh, I have no family, and <laughs> all I have is work, and so how does someone with a family balance it? I, I'm always very, very curious about that. Definitely, and we'll be right back with more of The Midday Show. Welcome back to The Midday Show. I'm here with one of my comedy heroes, Scott Ackerman. Comedy Bang Bang is tailing off the fourth season. Um, we're on the tail end of it, and it's on IFC Thursday nights at 10 p.m. Central here in the Midwest. And this week, um, as it is October 5th today, um, this week is Uzo Aduba, who, as you mentioned before, is the new Ed Asner. That's true, although I have to say, I actually think that particular show's on next week. I think oh. we're off this week. No, we're recording... Um... Oh, you're, oh, this is coming out on the 5th. Oh, yeah, yeah. so it's... Uh, sorry, I got the date wrong. So it's uh, the 8th. This yes. Thursday is when, is when the show's on, yeah. Exactly. Show business, Scott. Show business. I uh, thought uh, you were saying it was out on the 5th, and I was like, that's no, that's wrong. No. So it, this Thursday, yeah. In Radio Land, we are on the 5th right now. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, Uzo Aduba, she was awesome. She's super, super funny. And um, we actually, I think we had that episode slated for a little later in the season, but it came out so well that we moved it to the first episode. Awesome. Um, and it, it's a really ambitious episode, too. It's uh, got a big, uh, complicated storyline with um, John Hodgman in it. And uh, Thomas Middleditch also was on the couch on this episode playing a character. So it's a really interesting episode, I think. So as we mentioned, it's the fourth season. You're you're about to end it. You're in the last home stretch of it. Starting from the first season of the TV show, what ha what have you learned from from starting that starting filming that first episode to completing this last episode of season four? Um, it's interesting because I I look at the first season as a totally almost a totally different show in a way. We the, the first season we were really just playing around with the conventions of talk shows and, and of shows that had a host in them. And we were doing just sort of like, oh, okay, well, here's what a talk show does and here's our take on it. Um, and then, um, interestingly enough, in the second season, the structure of all IFC shows got changed um, to where every single show had to have a cold open and every single show had to have a very long first act. Um, and so a, a lot of those changes mixed with the request from the network that we do more story elements just sort of made the, the show sort of lock into a good groove for me where um, in the second season I really was like, okay, this year I just want to do any idea. Any, anything you think is funny, let's do it. You know, it doesn't have to be a take on a talk show. Well, the structure of our show it's such that we can do any idea and it's a great jumping off point into anything. So it really freed us up and, and because I think we were sort of running out of ideas at the end of the first 10 and since then we've done 80 more, um, which, which really just speaks to the fact that we were totally freed up by this new um, sort of structure of the show and, and the new ideology of it. So, you know, I would say what I've learned is, you know, I've learned how to make a more entertaining show. I think this fourth season is the best season we've ever done and, um, you know, better than the first season. Sometimes I feel like saying, hey, skip the first season and <laughs> just start, you know, season two. But, um, although I'm proud of the first season. But, um, you know, I think uh, what's interesting about this season of the show is I don't think any other comedy shows has even attempted to do what we've attempted and succeeded at, I think. I think 40 episodes of a scripted, even semi-scripted, you know, semi-improv television show that has as much comedy as we have has just never been attempted before. And, you know, I'm really proud of it. And I think, you know, the, not only that, but the, the diversity of the shows. I mean, we're doing so many different types of shows from the single camera um, episode where every act is in one shot to 
you know, we're doing a Rocky Horror musical episode. You know, every single episode is so different. And I don't think any show has ever done anything like it before. Definitely. And when you look at that first season, it it's even though it diverges in that in the later seasons, I think it just sets the tone of how how weird but wonderful the show is because when I describe it to people, it's really hard to describe. Eventually, I just have to say, you have to watch it because it's like a sitcom about a talk show, but it's not a sitcom at all, and it's scripted, but yet it's improv. It's it's just something that's so unique, and you just have to watch it, and that's what I love about the show. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it is unique. I, I've been trying to think of other talk shows like it, and there really aren't any. I mean, when you look at the fake talk shows in television history, like Fernwood Tonight or Knowing Me, Knowing You with Alan Partridge, they're usually all about the show. And every episode of our show has a storyline, like a sitcom storyline running through it about the making of the show or something that's happening during the show, um, as well as having the fake talk show parts and as well as having sketches in the middle you know, of the show. So it's a really, really unique show. And what we try to do is just fit as many jokes into every 22 minutes that we can. And I think, you know, pound for pound, we have more jokes than any other show on, on television. And what do you think has been your favorite kind of hook or gag or whatever? Because one of my favorites, I think, was Level Knevel. Well, it was a character, but another one, like a gag, was... um. Like, Cop Swap was funny. Do you have a favorite, like, hook or gag or character that you've done on the show? It's interesting because we've done 90 episodes at this point, and we're just about to to write our um, our next 20. And, um, you know, I guess it's interesting because you talk to musicians and you say, hey, what's your favorite record you've done? And they always talk about the recent one. And that's sort of how I feel, you know? I'm, like, really into the recent episodes we've done so um, you know I'm, I'm really excited that people haven't seen the episodes like the Clash of the Titans episode that we have coming up or our, our Christmas Beach Blanket Bingo musical episode or you know there's there's ones that I'm just excited for people to see um, but I'm you know I'm really proud of them all you know I mentioned the single take episode I was I was very proud that we pulled that off and that people were really receptive to it and and um, were impressed by the scope of what we tried to do. And that's, and that's what I mean, you know, I not only feel like we're really, really funny and the jokes are really good if you like those types of jokes, <laughs> but yeah. um, the, the scope of what we're trying to do with the show is just really unprecedented. I don't, you know, I think, I think, you know, it's, it's a shame that not more people watch it because I think they would be really impressed with what we're trying to do. And you have Kid Cudi now, who has replaced beloved Reggie Watts, um, who is now doing the Late Late Show. What has that dynamic shift been um, in coming on with Kid Cudi, wrapping up the end of the season with him, and starting out with Reggie from the first season? What has that new new dynamic looked like? Well, it it was a really tough situation. I mean, you know, and one that we thought about a lot about how to deal with because people love Reggie and a lot of the show was based upon our friendship. And we, you know, really wanted to make his send-off something special. And, and, um, you know, so it was an episode that we worked very, very hard on. And um, I think from the reaction to it, people really thought we did a great job. And then equally as hard is introducing a new character. And so it was something I studied for a long time. I studied the transition between beloved characters leaving a show and new characters joining. I mean, you look at Cheers, they did it twice with Coach leaving and Woody starting and then with Diane leaving and and Rebecca starting, you know? And so it it was something I really paid a lot of attention to. And it's difficult because, you know, you have Cuddy come in, who's such... Uh, an engaging and energetic performer and he really wanted his first episode to be like boom I'm here and I'm happy to be here and I'm I'm you know like here's everything I could do and I'm gonna wow you and then he read the first script and it was a script about how I didn't like him and I wanted him kicked off the show <laughs> and, you know and he was we had some discussions where he was like that's 
you know, why aren't people going to celebrate me when I come? And I, I really felt like it was necessary to sort of mirror the audience's feelings of like, okay, who are you, new guy? Uh, I like the old guy, and I, I, I'm wary of this whole new situation. And, and I treat him so poorly in that first episode that it makes everyone on Cubby's side. <laughs> and it, it's really an interesting sort of trick. Um, so, you know, once he saw the episode, he was like, I was nervous about this, but it really, really works because, you know, everyone who watches it is just like on his side about it. But it's, it's interesting. They're different performers, and Reggie is more laid back, and Cuddy is, is more energetic and, you know, has so much positive energy. And, and so, you know, he's a really talented performer, and I think people are, are really getting into him. And, and the trick is just to, to use him in the right way and to learn to write for his voice and to, to you know, maximize the amount of time that we have with him, which with the band leaders is not always as much time as I have. Um, you know, Reggie or and Cuddy both have like more limited time than I have to be on the show. So it's you know, some, sometimes people say, "Hey, why isn't Cuddy involved in this week's episode as much?" And I'm like, "Well, you know, it's just I have more time than they do to devote to the show." You know, so so I, but I think it's a really exciting and, it, and it's cool to have new blood in the show and has sort of like rebooted it in a way. Definitely. And my thanks to Scott Ackman. Stay tuned for Carson Daly, and we'll see you next time here on the Midday Show on ECAV Radio.